Well, hello everybody. My name is Paul and I am a whole family student guide at the Harvard Art Museums. And today I'm very happy to be sitting down with Lynette Roth, the Daimler curator of the Bush Reisinger Museum and the head of the Division of Modern and Contemporary Art at the Harvard Art Museums. So today we're going to take a closer look at a painting by Emil Nolde called Mulatto. So Lynette, why don't you just tell us a little bit about yourself and about the painting? Great. I've been thinking quite a bit actually about this painting by Emil Nolde since I started at the Harvard Art Museums. And uh, when I planned the installation of the reopening of the museums in 2014, I also included it in our installation. And it was there really as an example of German Expressionism. So a movement around the turn of the last century, really kind of solidifying around 1905. And as a great example of Emil Nolde's work from that period. And as we are rethinking the installation of some of our galleries, I've started thinking about different contexts in which we might sort of approach the painting. So what sorts of questions are on your mind as you're thinking about how to reframe this when the museums eventually reopen? This is a work that, as we'll talk about later on, the artist's own personal beliefs raise a lot of questions for us. But just looking at it, too, I mean, it deals so clearly with race. It's filtered through the gaze of a white artist. How do we talk about a work like this in a time like this? Yes, it's. I mean, that's exactly the, the kinds of questions that I've been asking myself and that we've been asking ourselves as a team. And in fact, uh, I had a conversation during this pandemic year with the student guides uh, and with many colleagues of mine around uh, a painting, which really already in its title, Mulatto, signals the fact that uh, the artist Nolde is defining his subject you know, solely by her mixed race heritage. And of course, that's a term that is now considered offensive because it devalues people based on Black ancestry. So it's also a term we don't use anymore. Uh, and that was, in fact, already noted on the existing label, but based on the conversations around race and also around a new work being done on the artist, I thought it was actually you know, time uh, to really try and dig in a bit more into those issues. And I should say that German Expressionism uh, as a movement, and this painting in particular has really been celebrated for breaking uh, academic traditions in art at the time by really sort of forcing a move in many ways um, to a greater sense of expressive freedom, hence the term which the artists did not come up with themselves, but this idea that this, you know, incredible color and gestural brushwork, right, had something to do with a reflection of their kind of inner state. And so we get in uh, this painting by Nolde, this, what I consider to be very um, celebratory painting of a Black woman, and uh, she's sort of surrounded by almost like a halo of light, which we now read as the kind of gas light in maybe she's getting ready to go on stage as a performer. Mm -hmm. um, um, Nolde wintered in Berlin, around this time every year and was just fascinated with uh, performance, like many expressionist artists, right? The circus, the nightclub, you know, these are, are really some of their most beloved motifs. Thinking about the painting can actually see it then as a great uh, example for that period in Germany where this growing metropolis of Berlin was really attracting also uh, a very diverse, group of people. I just think of it almost as a sort of historical document of that particular moment. Um, I think another thing that comes to mind too is this has previously been read at least through sort of the lens of Nolde's colonial adventures. Um, it was previously thought that this was done during those. So maybe you could talk a little more about Nolde and colonialism, that sort of mix up that happened there with the dating and how that affects how we read this work. Yeah, I think as we now have a growing 
public acknowledgement of the atrocities committed by European colonial powers and, and really the pervasive effects of occupation and genocide, right? We, we talk about a lot of those issues and of course in the study of German art of the 20th century, German expressionism is one of those places. These artists are looking to African and Oceanian and, uh, cultures and art are actually visiting the ethnographic museums in Dresden and Berlin. They're reading publications that are coming out around that time about this material culture and art. And they're actually even collecting the art themselves. There's really no way to separate this interest in African and Oceanian uh, culture from a lot of the stylistic formal developments that the artists are making, but they also believed in a very Eurocentric view that non-European peoples were somehow natural, were somehow more connected to the earth. Actually, women and women's bodies also get coded um, in, a, in a similar way. I think as we start to, to examine those legacies, we, we have to remind ourselves that but at the height of expressionism, we're actually at the height of imperial Germany. And so all of this is, is made possible through Germany's colonial power. Nolde actually accompanies a German colonial expedition to uh, what was then German New Guinea in, in the South Pacific right after he finished the painting Mulatto. And a dating sort of mishap around this painting, which dated it to 1915, led scholars early on, including um, from, from the museum, to consider this depiction of a Black woman to be an island native. Right. So he did a lot of sketching when he was there and there are um, paintings and, and sketches and watercolors. And um, because it was thought this painting was 1915, because she was black, it was assumed to be an island native. Now we know, based on the painting uh, itself, the verso of the painting and information from the Nolde Zebu Foundation, that actually this painting was painted in 1913 and so precedes that trip and situates then this subject, this unknown subject, right? We don't have a name for her in Germany. You know, and again, we've known that for a while. Uh, so it's not like I've just discovered that this was a painting from 1913. But what it did was in some ways made me think more specifically about the year 1913. And I came across German legislation that same year that um, barred Germans of African descent from becoming citizens. So it was the introduction in 1913, the same year that Nolde is painting this black German subject that it was literally written into law that one had to be of German blood in order to be a German citizen. So actually the subject of Mulatto is actually a woman living and working in one of the few milieus that would have also been open for her to work in at the time. And it's the same year that German law makes it impossible for her to become a German citizen. You know, that sort of coming together, thinking about dating, uh, looking to the field of Black German studies, uh, really kind of brought that home for me. Uh, and I think in some ways speaks to a lot of the current discussions uh, around race and nationhood, you know, what defines who we are and, and how we think about, certainly in this country, about Germany and about what is German. I didn't realize that bit about the, the legislation in that same year. It's interesting that you point out too how this resonates with the current moment. I mean, especially with a piece with a title like this, sometimes it might seem a bit shocking. Encountering it in a gallery, one might almost have wondered how to deal with it at first, but then pointing out that there's stories to be told here that really intersect and bring us to our current time. Um, I want to ask a little more too. You mentioned how Nolde and other artists working in this primitivist mode of thinking were drawn to the sort of 
originality, or so they said, of these cultures. Nolde even advocated for decreasing colonialism, correct, to yeah. um, kind yeah. of preserve that, which of course is highly problematic. But we also know that Nolde himself held some other very kind of concerning beliefs. Um, he was very anti-Semitic. Famously, he was part of the Nazi party, although that hasn't always been talked about. He wrote about the mixing of races himself. How do you decide which sort of story to tell here? I mean, there's so much to sort of sort through. What, what, what do you do as a curator to decide which veins to bring out and which not to? Yeah, I think that's really the challenge. And I would say, you know, think about Nolde and Nolde's views on race. That is is a, is a dissertation, right? Uh, and in the museum, we have 150 words on our wall labels. And what I've tried to do now for when we reopen in, uh, in the fall, actually with this painting on the sight line into the Bush Rising or Museum Gallery. So visitors who, who are familiar with the museum will know that that prominent place has been occupied uh, by Max Beckmann's uh, iconic self-portrait in tuxedo. And, and curators love to think about sight lines, right? It's also, it's also the thing that signals to you what's in that gallery? Do I want to keep going in that gallery? Or do I want to go somewhere else? So my thinking now is what if we were to put Nolde's mulatto on the sideline, right? To sort of signal the very complexity of this painting, of Nolde's own views. And also, we haven't even gotten to that yet, the fact that this painting was removed from a German collection by the National Socialists as part of their degenerate art campaign. So um, again, there are these kind of various ways we can approach it. Yeah, I love that you brought up the sight lines because I think, you know, certainly before I started working in a museum, that wasn't something that I really realized was at play, like the relationship between objects and how they're positioned. The other thing which maybe we can talk a little more about is that degenerate art campaign. We've been covering this a little bit. I mean, what was it about Nolde's works that earned him the title of a degenerate artist under the Nazis? Was it the style or was it something else? I, I know you and I have talked a little bit about this before, but... In some ways, it's an oversimplification to say, right, that it was simply style that led to a work being defamed as degenerate um, by the Nazis. In, in 1937, it was Joseph Goebbels, who was a uh, Reich Minister for Public Enlightenment and Propaganda, and he was the one who really instructed a committee to remove all works from the country's municipal museums. So this is, of course, separate from works that were confiscated from um, private individuals, or, uh, works that were part of forced sales as uh, those who were racially or politically persecuted by the regime had to leave Germany, right? So this was actually a committee formed by the National Socialists um, that went into their own municipal collections. And uh, the definition, I have it here so I can just read it verbatim is uh, uh, to remove all works that quote insult German feeling or destroy or confuse natural form or simply reveal an absence of adequate manual or artistic skill. So there we're at the sort of like you know oh my kid could do that kind of critique of um, modernism <laughs> but also um, those that were found to insult German feeling. So I think if I could see that the Nolde, you know, in both its um, style, right? So this, you know, thick uh, brushwork, um, the fact that, you know, these are non-naturalistic, this is a non-naturalistic use of, of colors, uh, and also the fact that the subject was Black. Uh, in some ways, the idea of insulting German feeling, right, is also about who gets represented, right? Who, who is the idea of not just womanhood, right? Um, but Germanness. And that again, I think plays into this painting, right? In 1937, right? Being removed from a museum goes back to those same issues in 1913 about sort of deciding who belongs and, and who doesn't. Yeah, the, the other thing that it would be interesting to discuss is, we've, we've talked a bit before about how sometimes there's a, a tendency to see artists like Nolde who had their works seized like this as 
a sort of hero. It seems pretty straightforward at first glance, like these guys were the enemies of the Nazis, right? But certainly there's been a lot of attention in recent years going into, as we've been talking about, Nolda's own beliefs on race, his actual membership in the Nazi party. Can you talk a little more about how that played into his relationship with the Degenerate Art Campaign, how we should make sense of an artist who was really at many times very avidly pro-Hitler? I mean, I think no one was more surprised than Nolda that his works were not considered to be German enough at this moment, right? So he has a campaign where he basically says, my work is is as German as it gets. You know, that is obviously underscored by his um, membership uh, in the party. And that's why I think Nolde is such a, an important example for us to actually think about how complicated all of this was that it, you know, it really was not, okay, this is in, this is out, you know, certainly prior to 1937, there were huge debates going on uh, within the national socialist regime about what actually was acceptable or what was work that would be, you know, that wouldn't insult German feeling, right? So, and I, I think when we think about how how this is important for us to think about today, uh, you and I have talked about how it is also a, uh, a construction, right? I mean, even the use of the language of degenerate, right? Um, that we now kind of use as if it means something, right? As if it actually tells us something about this work how an argument against you know, art or literature or whatever it is can, can sort of be constructed. And Nolda shows us kind of the cracks, right? Nolda, Nolda is, he's not someone who was uh, openly resisting. Uh, he was not an artist who left Germany because he was himself persecuted. Um, and many of the artists who actually left Germany uh, who were whose works were declared degenerate? They they often left um, if they weren't racially or politically persecuted. They left because they couldn't work in Germany anymore. They lost their teaching positions. They lost the ability to exhibit or sell their work. And so I often say there are as many case studies as there are artists. And I would say Nolda, because he actually sought favor with the regime, who then declared in this 1937 um, campaign, really that he was not uh, someone that they sought to promote, you know, really shows, I think, how in some ways, I don't wanna say arbitrary because certainly, you know, the work really did um, focus on the defamation of modernism, but there were artists who were in both the 1937 Degenerate Art Exhibition and in the German Art Exhibition nearby uh, that was promoted by the Nazis and opened by Adolf Hitler. You know, so did it depend on what the work was? Yes, sometimes. But uh, again, I think it shows us how much of a construction all these ideological arguments around art really are. Artists and artist biographies are also a construction. After the war, uh, Nolde cultivated his own version of what happened during the Nazi period, as did right. many of his contemporaries. And the, the exhibition that I did in 2018 called Inventur actually looked at modern artists that stayed in Nazi Germany to make sort of precisely that point, right? That often artist biographies would just stop in 1933 and start again in 1945. Then, you know, for Nolde, um, this book, The German Lesson by Siegfried Lenz, basically right. led, you know, generations to understand Nolde as, in many ways, even though he's not sort of named as the artist, but it's, you know, Lenz kind of describes this artist that everyone implicitly knew was Nolde as a resistor. It's not that we haven't known all of this. That's the other thing I sort mm -hmm. of feel like, you know, if you look at the scholarship, it's not like we've just realized um, that Nolde was an anti-Semite. There was definitely an opening up of his archive and the introduction of those issues in an exhibition in Berlin a, a couple of years ago on Nolde in Nazi Germany, right? Really also 
presented that research and that information in a very public way. So it also shows, I think, what the museum can do, right? What scholars may be circling around this, but once it actually becomes the subject of a museum exhibition and the public is forced to think about that, right? You know, how do you reconcile an artist's personal political views uh, with, with their work, which, you know, in the case of Nolda was groundbreaking modernist work that changed the face of not just German art, right? But, but really certainly European modernism. So um, can I add one more thing? Please. Paul, earlier you mentioned the fact that we've sort of accepted these artists who were declared degenerate as, you know, quote unquote heroes. And I would say that actually that is largely an American phenomenon. So the Bush Reisinger Museum is unique because it is, you know, uh, the, the only museum in North America that really focuses on the art of German speaking countries really throughout time. And it was critical in like um, MoMA and uh, a number of other institutions and in really defining sort of how we understood German art at mid-century, right? So around this the same time of uh, the degenerate art exhibition in Germany. And so you actually see that just as Nolda's painting is being exhibited in the infamous degenerate art exhibition, it then is determined to be valuable, mm -hmm. sold on the international market. Many of the works that are in the Busch Eisinger Museum are in the museum because they were removed from German museum collections. Right? So you have to imagine if there was no degenerate art campaign, I mean, who knows what the museum would be, right? And in some ways, I always say too, you know, the decision on the part of the Nazis to vilify modernism, if that had not been the work defamed and removed from German collections, it never would have entered the American market. And American exhibitions in the 1930s were, you know, jumping on this, right? It was, you know, the, the art that Hitler hated, right? Was touring the country. And our own mythologizing around it allowed these German artists to, to embody democratic ideals and so complicating that by saying but wait you know a lot of them didn't leave germany or you know many of them before they left germany you know worked um and created nazi propaganda or and so on and so forth right so in some ways our own museum history uh, at the Bush Reisinger, but also in the united states really contributed to that myth and of course it was one that germans were more than happy to embrace um, after the Second World War, right? It sort of provided the possibility for German art to have an audience in the U.S. after two world wars. To come back to your earlier question, because obviously I could talk forever here, mm -hmm. how, do you, how do you actually address all of this in the museum? And I think maybe the best solution is to address it in forums like this, in conversations, in interactive talks and online. Um, I think I would say to anyone who encounters any work of art in, in a museum to first of all say, somebody put this here. This is not just here, right? But that somebody is making this decision. Why are they making this decision? You know, what is my response uh, to this work? How can I learn more and engage in in those kinds of conversations, I think is, is really, you know, beyond the close looking is, is really the way to, to really start to, I always say unpack because there's so much, I mean, we've only been talking about one painting and not even really in that great <laughs> detail about the mm -hmm. painting itself. So. I, I love that last thing you said about how it's important when you go to a museum to sort of think critically about, okay, this text didn't come from nowhere, this work didn't end up in this spot just by accident, what's going on here, what stories are being told, what stories aren't being told. I think a lot of the time, 
it's easy to kind of forget about that. But hopefully today we've made one small dent in, in all <laughs> the many, many possible things to talk about. Um, but this has been fantastic. So thank you so much. Thank you so much for your time. So I'm excited to see the reframe in the fall. And- <laughs>